All right. So we have been able to kind of like paint a pretty specific, in-depth kind of deep dive into what's been going on in Azov stall recently and what's been going on as far as the future of Ukraine and the region. But it's always opportunities like this where we need to take a step back a little bit and we need to ask tougher questions like, how did we get here? And what is the fundamental and underlying history of what's happened here, right? How did we get to a point where Nova Russia is going back to Russia? And how did we get to a point where Ukraine as a state is no longer going to exist? I am not really satisfied with moralistic pictures of good or evil. What I want to set about to do today, and what I want to accomplish definitively, is actually engage in a type of materialist analysis of the history of Russia and Ukraine following the fall of the Soviet Union, leading up to the events of the Maidan coup and the implications that this has for Russia. I think you got a sneak peek and a little bit of a hint of that in that kind of debate I had with the Lithuanian guy. But we're dealing with a very interesting scenario, which I think deserves more thought, more analysis, and more reflection than just good and bad narratives about what's been going on. Now, we know for a fact that the Western press is full of shit and they're inaccurately reporting on what's going on. And I think we get that. And I'm not so much interested anymore in just reporting the details of that. I want us to think more deeply and broadly as Marxist Leninists and with the tools of analysis available to us using Marxist Leninist theory to be able to have a superior understanding of how it got to this point. Okay. And that's what I want to, I want to set about to do here. Right. Um, so we could have a more kind of neutral, just objective understanding underlying, because I think that's what's missing, right? We're caught up in this info war where they're saying, okay, they're lying a lot of, about Russia. We're telling the truth about Russia. Where's the neutrality? Where's the objectivity? Where's a, a basic sense of reality unperturbed by ideological prejudices and, and national passions and things like that? And that's what I want to set about to accomplish with today's stream. And it actually is going to be the main theme of today's stream. It's going to be about the future of Russia itself, where Russia's going right now, what implications the end of the Soviet Union had for Russia. These kind of big topics of analysis are basically the meat and potatoes and the thrust of what direction I want my future streams to take in general. I don't want to just be a news streamer. I want to be able to stream big ideas and and, and um, broader forms of analysis about these types of things, right? So the first thing we have to point out is there's a lot of details people miss that are important to bring into the picture. And we're going to go from an analysis that's based on the hurried kind of excitement of what's on the daily headlines of, oh, Russia's doing this, Russia's doing that, to let's just broaden the context and create a hermeneutic circle. So I'm going to teach you today what a hermeneutic circle is. So a hermeneutic circle is basically a, a way of deriving meaning and knowledge from a given object or from a different, from a given body of work, a book, a region, a history, whatever you want, where knowing details allows you to paint a big, broad picture. And with that big, broad picture, you get more details. And with more details, the big, broad picture starts to be more complete. The issue with the hermeneutic circle, the kind of paradox it represents, is that every detail of knowledge reflects some broad picture. But every broad picture is only given expression through these little details. And they work together dialectically to give us a more holistic understanding of the situation. So when we actually have a deep analysis of what's going on, of the history and all these kinds of things, we're beginning from the particular then to the universal rather than the reverse. We're not beginning from some universal ideological claim and then filling in the blanks. We're actually beginning from some kind of objective analysis, right? And that analysis isn't, isn't, is informed of all of the biases and ideological fanaticism that prevents people from being able to have an accurate picture of what's going on, sure, right? But it's also an analysis that's going to need to arrive at a positive, objective kind of conclusion rather than just the fact that, okay, the West is bad, Ukraine's bad, Azov is bad. We get that. But what actually is going on here, right? And this speaks to the mission statement of Infrared. Infrared's original mission statement was Marxist-Leninist analysis 
beyond the visible beyond the visual spectrum right um beyond the visible spectrum beyond what's immediately apparent to us so the first thing i want to present to you is this article by Catahan, the Catahan Institute, which talks pretty briefly about the history of Novorossiya and Ukraine, right? So here, they talk about how there are several lies, and this was from 2016, circulating on the internet regarding former Ukraine, Novorossiya, and Russia. These lies are spread by the Kiev Nazis, trolls, and their American masters with the obvious goal of disinformation, but only fools will believe it. So, the first lie you're going to hear commonly about the situation is that the Ukrainian people chose to go to the EU. Well, it's not true because these people, and I'm showing it to you on a map, chose not to do that. They chose to go toward Russia, the Russian world, the customs union, Belarus and Kazakhstan, when they elected Yanukovych as president and a pro-Russian Rada in the last uh, legitimate elections before the Nazi coup. Then there was a coup directed from the U.S. against the legal president and government. All elections after the Nazi coup are void and illegal, were neither democratic nor fair, as all the opposition has been banned, imprisoned, or killed. Let no one forget this. We do not want the traitors to distort the facts. The Russians in Novorossiya and Malorossiya, the Russian-speaking Ukrainians in the central parts, if they are allowed to speak what they want, or of all the people of mixed origin. The next lie. Russia doesn't need Novorossiya. Those who make this statement have no idea about Russian history or culture, and they have no knowledge of geopolitics in general and security politics in particular. Russia needs Novorossiya for many reasons. First and most important, because it is a genuine part of Russia and has been for 300 years. It was stolen from Russia during a period of Russian weakness and when Russia was ruled by American lackeys in the 1990s. The majority of the people in Novorossiya are Russians or Russian-speaking Ukrainians who are opposed to the Kiev junta and who want to join the Russian world. But Novorossiya is also a shield of Russia against NATO aggression and enemy military bases. Now, this is what I really want to highlight here because when it comes to coming to a materialist analysis of why Novorossiya is so important, we can't just proceed a kind of national analysis we can't just proceed even from a perspective of military strategy because ultimately war is an extension of politics and this would be engaging in the kind of cardinal sin of idealism it would be assuming that political formations are what's behind all of this it would be assuming even that national formations are behind what's all of this when a materialist is going to proceed at the most fundamental level of what the essence of all of those things are what makes a nation what makes politics? This is what's at stake in being able to form a coherent and sustainable analysis of what's been going on in Ukraine. So the same is true for Eastern Malorossiya. All lands east of the Dnieper, I can't pronounce that correctly, is Russian land paid for by Russian blood many times over through history. It is treason to even think of abandoning these lands to Nazis and to NATO. Yet another lie to be exposed. There will be a world war if Russia liberates Novorossiya. This is absurd, and it's contradicted by statements from the Europe and USA. None are prepared to go to war to save some Nazis in Kiev, especially as any Russian liberation would be just that, a liberation and not an occupation. This liberation would not be extended to Galicia, because that part was never genuine Russian land and is too infected with Nazis to be worth the cost of denazification. So, if you don't know what Galicia is, right? Um, Galicia is right here. Sorry, fuck. It's different. There's one in Spain and there's one in France. It's right here, right? So this is what they're talking about. This part was never historically Russian land. It was taken from the Poles, I think, by Stalin. It had Belarusian and Ukrainian populations living there, which the Poles oppressed. But historically speaking, I mean, this is Austria-Hungary, this is the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, whatever, it's not really historically Russian land. They, they don't think they're ever going to be able to take this, right? They have no illusions as far as that's concerned. Um, you know, another lie is that the Russian world is only Russian. Now, this is a pretty interesting part of the article, I think, because people think these are fascists, you know, because these are the fourth position as Duganists, right? so these might be fascists. Well, look what they're saying, and this is going to actually piss off a lot of, like, alt-right you know, type of people, but this is what they say. Actually, there are no limits to the Russian world. If a person would like to join the Russian world for whatever reason, they should be welcome. It could be that a person has a Russian spouse, 
likes Russian culture or Russian orthodoxy or lifestyle and so on. And I'm not talking about creating ghettos like what happened in Western Europe. Any person joining the Russian world should be willing to assimilate at least to a certain degree to Russian society without having to deny his or her own roots. Russia ought to take in half a million such people from all over the world annually. And they should preferably be young and educated or willing to get an education in their new country. There are quite a lot of such people all over the world that would give Russia a chance. That would boost the Russian economy and society too. And of course, refugees from former Ukraine and Novorossiya should also be taken into Russia, but with a clear understanding that they will be returned to a liberated Novorossiya and Malorossiya sooner or later. Geopolitically, geographically, it's of course easier to define the Russian world. Russian Federation plus Belarus plus Northern Kazakhstan plus Novorossiya, plus Eastern Malorossiya, Transnistria, Abkhazia, Southern Ossetia, and some regions of the Baltics such as Narva. Any part of this territory is just as holy in Russian as is Moscow should be as equally defended. So that's a kind of picture of the geopolitical vision underlying this. But I think that's a kind of weakness of our analysis thus far is that we have overwhelmingly relied on a geopolitical-based analysis, a political-based analysis in general. Almost everything I just described to you and read out to you in that article ultimately boils down to politics. It doesn't boil down to a materialist conception or understanding of the situation. In order to break that down, we need a deeper understanding of the circumstances surrounding the fall of the Soviet Union and the implications it had for the peoples living in that region in a material sense, okay? And we're going to begin here with the Donbass itself and its significance. Now, I want to paint a picture to you because I think it's pretty easy to draw a materialist analysis of American politics, specifically when it comes to regions like West Virginia. West Virginia was a coal mining state, and, you know, that's where Joe Manchin and the rest are based, That's where a lot of Republicans and support for Trump is based, is that you basically had these heavy industries that define the backbone of the American national economy, and these people's jobs were threatened or otherwise not invested in it as much, and that's kind of defined the politics of the region. It's about preserving that older way of life, and I think that's a really easy materialist analysis to draw from, to explain a lot about you know, what goes on in American politics. Why do you have Joe Manchin and people like that elected into Congress? Uh, Well, it's because of coal, because the progressives want to eliminate coal, and coal is the source of livelihood of the people living in West Virginia, right? And then you have this whole understanding of a materialist understanding of, of political economy itself, where it's quite literally political economy, that America's regulatory kind of monopoly state in conjunction with coal companies and oil companies and car companies and manufacturing all form this kind of totality of an American dream and an American way of life, which actually defined people's living being and it defined their way of life and it defined them as a class, a new type of class. People, it's not quite the working class of the past, which you know had no country. It, it was a working class that somehow had a country that had some investment or stake in the state. And, you know, most Marxists are going to define that as a labor aristocracy, but I I think that's simplistic. The the labor aristocracy Lenin talked about was like the upper stratum of the labor movement. This is a mass phenomena that defined people from the bottom up, the very soil of the people themselves, right? Well, as it happened, this kind of American dream can also be translated in the Soviet and Russian context. Because just like there was an American dream, there was also a Soviet dream in the form of the Soviet economy itself, the heavy industries of the Soviet working class that were employed. I mean, this, there was a Soviet dream. The Soviet worker, right, had a DACA in the con- dacha in the countryside. They had a, a house or an apartment. They had a little farm. If they were peasants toiling on the soil, they had a very specific way of life that was tied to heavy industry and to manufacturing, right? They didn't have that service economy bullshit. They didn't have that tech economy bullshit. It was, it's very similar. When you compare the American economy in the 20th century to the Soviet economy in the 20th century from a sociological perspective, there's a lot of differences, but there's also a lot of similarities. I mean, both, a lot of people get pissed off by this, but I mean, you're dealing with a situation where most of the world is turning in a socialistic direction, the US included. 
The state is increasingly becoming a worker state where its vast regulations and its vast mechanisms of economic control have to take into account people's ability to like get by and it has to take social considerations into account. It has to take the life of the working class and the American dream into account. I'm not saying the American state served the working class. It was a worker state, a sense of a proletarian dictatorship. Clearly it was a state that served the interests of financiers and financial capitalists and capitalist monopolists and city of London bankers and all those kind of fucking spooky people, whatever, right? Um, but the sta- I'm just trying to say that there were aspects of it that you could co- you could vaguely colloquially, if you're not too autistic about it, say it's a worker state. You know, if you get autistic about it, clearly it's not a worker state. But to some extent, the state and the economy is being fashioned around the reproduction of a very specific way of life. Now, the intention behind that, as far as the ruling class and the bourgeoisie was concerned in the 20th century, was to make sure that the working class would be satisfied and complacent and wouldn't turn to communism, right? So that was the reason, that was the motivation, and that was the intention behind that. And I don't think it was only that either. I think to a certain extent, the Democratic Party and other parties did kind of, you know, gain their mandate and their power from this kind of working class. Um, But they were still captured and completely beholden to these capitalists. But there was some measure of a state infrastructure that had emerged that wasn't directly controlled by the capitalist class, if that makes sense. Like, it was this arrangement, you can vaguely call it socialistic, you can call it whatever the fuck you want, but it existed for social reasons. It didn't just exist to make the capitalists rich. Um, It ultimately figured in the wider imperialist state machinery, sure. Especially the system of global imperialist control, sure. But the only real evidence that you need that it wasn't directly serving the interests of capital lies in the fact that in the so-called era of neoliberalism, much like the dismantlement of the USSR and the Soviet Union itself, this entire thing was dismantled, right? It was it was completely di- divested. It, 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 the state ceased to invest in it. The people in West Virginia were left behind. The people in Ohio and Detroit, Indiana were left behind. Manufacturing was outsourced to Mexico and it was outsourced overseas so very clearly that degree of socialization that had occurred after the post-war period wasn't only to support profit there was a degree of like american socialism that emerged i mean say it was ultimately fascistic or social fascist and i'm open to that interpretation as well but i i don't buy the idea that it was just oh this is just part of capital no it's clearly this is a post not post imperialist because it's still part of imperialism, right? But it's 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 something beyond what Lenin described in imperialism. Is all I'm trying to say, right? Someone's in show queue. Um, no, yeah, okay. This I'm gonna get through this lecture, and then we might be able to take in Collins if we have some time to spare, right? Because I want to get into this deep dive of analysis. So I'm gonna show you a map right now of what is actually the part Eastern Ukraine and the Donbass region, right? So this was a propaganda poster from the Soviet period. And what you're witnessing here is that this part is powering the entirety of the Soviet Union's economy and its industry. So factories all over the Soviet Union being powered by this. Now, what is this? What actually is this? Well, where it is, is in the eastern part of Ukraine. It's in the Donbass. But what is it? Well, if you speak Russian, I think it's here, but it's coal. So this is a basin in eastern Ukraine. That was responsible for the overwhelming majority of the energy consumption of the Soviet Union internally. Now, the Soviet Union was an oil exporting country after the 1970s. But in terms of the internal consumption of energy that fueled Soviet industry itself, um, this was coming from the uh, Donetsk Basin, similar to West Virginia, right? It's just this part of Soviet Union, just like how West Virginia is a part of America, which is a coal producing region. Okay, and that was actually the source of livelihood for the people living here. So all of the infrastructure that was built in the Dunya, in the Donbass region, right? All of the way of life, the education, the facilities, the food that people consumed, the way in which they consumed it, all that was through the wealth that was being um, created because of coal, because of the specific economic arrangement it had with the rest of the Soviet Union. So, and to give more context, to give more added context to this, 
Um, to this day, the infrastructure, the cities, the towns that exist in the Donbass region are a leftover of that Soviet era. So that's the first thing I want you guys to keep in mind and keep in, in, in your head, right? Um, it's a very important point. I want you guys to lodge it and keep it in your heads. That's the context of the Donetsk region. Now, I'll show you a more contemporary map, show you the significance coal still has. Thank you, OG. Do you OG. think slow expansion of socialism in U.S. is bad because it gives people enough reason to not overthrow government as a whole like Marx intended? No. And the reasons people have to overthrow the government isn't to establish socialism. Now, that's a common myth. A lot of people will tell you, oh, we need a revolution to create socialism. Anyone who tells you that revolutions are about creating socialism is a dumb fuck, doesn't know shit about history or Marxism, and is a fucking lying, dumb piece of shit, okay? First of all, Marx talked about violent revolutions within the context of overthrowing the ancient regime. So those were revolutions that weren't being created because of ideology, but were revolutions like the French Revolution that took form because of an antagonism between a democratic petty bourgeoisie from the countryside and the aristocrats and feudal ancient regime. So that was actually the source of revolution Marx was talking about, okay? And Marx was basically saying that the proletarian revolution is going to be like a cherry on top of this. And he said that in places that have already had their democratic revolution, like the United States or even England, he said, right, it's possible for a peaceful transition to occur. Now, the reason Marx and Engels changed their view about this is because of the rise of the imperialist state machinery, which actually overturned a bourgeois democracy. Right? And it had to be smashed into a thousand pieces. Marx writes about this in his writings on the Civil War in France. and Also in his writings about the Paris Commune more generally. Right, And that isn't because, again, it's not because of ideology. It's because a contradiction is forming between the vast state bureaucratic machinery and this imperialist state machinery. And again, uh, the proverbial peasant in the countryside, and in Marx's case, the French peasant, who's being indebted to banks um, and who's, who's having all of their economic life being sucked out of them, again, through, through rentier capitalist feudal-like monopolists, right? So the reasons violent revolutions happen, uh, according to Marxism, is not because the proletarian dictatorship should be established. It's not because of some fucking ideological vision. It's not because of socialism. It's not because of any of those fucking things. Violent revolution is an ine- it's a sociological phenomena. It's what we call today populism. It's literally the same thing. It's a sociological phenomena where the majority of people materially enter into contradiction with the establishment just as a general law of social revolution, right? And the whole point of ideology is to guide that, not to create it. That's what happened in Russia. The contradiction between the peasants in Russia and the the, 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 the the czar and the nobility wasn't because of ideology. It was because there was a genuine material contradiction there, which the Bolsheviks only led. That's why they said peace, land, and bread and not socialism. They didn't say any of that shit. They said peace, land, and bread because they were leading that revolution. Okay? So, yeah, I know that's a lot of time taken up for one super chat, but it's something I just need to always stress time and time again that it's just such a common myth people arrive at that that revolutions are because of you know whatever so anyway this is a more contemporary map of ukraine and look at this okay so so here this region of ukraine produces 18.4 billion tons of coal 15.6 billion tons of coal 5.3 billion tons of coal so this is the donetsk donetsk region we're talking about here in ukraine um so, nationally speaking, yes, these people are Russian speakers. Many are ethnic Russians. But what is the more fundamental connection that they have to Russia that is actually responsible for the conflict at large? Well, it has a lot to do, again, with coal. Now, after the fall of the Soviet Union, okay, um, investing in coal... Well, a few things happen, right? And this is true for both Russia and it's true for Ukraine. And this is actually going to be the formative context 
of the Maidan protests, which is why the story of how Ukraine and Russia got to this point is actually kind of more like a tragedy rather than a one-sided story of good versus evil. It's more like a tragedy, Please. right? Ukraine had most of Soviet heavy industry. It was built specifically to cooperate with Russian industry. The separation of Russia and Ukraine was particularly painful. The Atlanticist plan. Thank you so much, Chris Morlock. I appreciate so much the that super chat. Thank you so much, man. Anyway, um, when the Soviet Union collapsed, I'm sure you guys know what happened. You had an oligarchic class emerge both in Russia and in Ukraine. So all of the industry, as Morlock himself pointed out, that was built up under the Soviet Union throughout all of Ukraine, not just Eastern Ukraine, all of Ukraine, was bought out by these oligarchs, right? And what oligarchs basically did is that they privatized socialism. They kept these very vast companies and entities intact that were kind of like fractures of, they were kind of little pieces of the Soviet giant central planning. What the oligarchs did is they consolidated all of these kinds of means of production in the form of these like privatized socialistic you know, equity companies and, and general companies and whatever, I bundled them all together into this kind of like private form of a mini centrally planned economy and private kingdom where the, a lot of people need to understand this. Much of the necrosis of the Soviet industry is because of the oligarchs. The oligarchs are parasites. What they did is that they took all of the infrastructure that was built under the Soviet Union and they turned those into financial speculative assets. They didn't invest in them. They didn't update any of the infrastructure. They just extract rent from that infrastructure from the so former Soviet peoples in order to turn them into like financial assets which are then integrated into the world of international finance and offshore companies through the city of London and all that kind of stuff. So basically, the Soviet economy wasn't actually dissolved. A lot of people think, oh, socialism was abolished. Well, ideologically, yeah. But in terms of that like centrally planned economy in general, it was divided up into little bits and pieces where these like new lords, these for all intents and purposes, feudal lords, took over these segments of this wider Soviet planned economy. And they kept them running and kept them intact, but they charge the, the former Soviet population like these rents in order to be able to live. So these are like literally like vampire parasites who took over segments of the former Soviet economy, right? And unlike the Soviet Union, they didn't reinvest in this stuff. They didn't update it in any kind of way or integrate it into like this greater polarity or greater whole that benefits the whole people you know as a holistic entity they turn them into financial assets and instruments integrated into world of international finance centered in the city of london i should add and and wall street and whatever right basically turning them into parts of the kind of western polarity now russia's game-changing nationalization of the oil industry under putin was pretty much the first act that offset that and established some form of economic sovereignty. Now, when we're talking about e economic sovereignty, I want to don't just like let that fly over your head. I actually want you to think about what that entails. Economic sovereignty means you basically are having a part of your economy that is being organized around serving your economy and serving your sphere. So in this case, Russia's oil industry allows the Russian government to invest in its population. It allows them to build Russian industries. It allows them to fuel and power a Russian economy, right? Whereas in the oligarchic type of arrangement of the privatizations of the 1990s, both in Ukraine and in the former, sorry, and in Russia, you had these basic parasites gobble up big pieces of the former Soviet planned economy um, keep the people who relied on them in order to survive on a lifeline and basically charge them rent to continue existing and subsisting on them. So basically, I want to like give you a better representation of what, what that would be like, right? So let's say you were like on life support in a hospital, right? And that was basically kind of free, right? I just put it that way. And some guy comes and, and takes over the life support with a gun and he says... I'm going to call your mother. Every hour, she's going to give me $5 or I'm going to unplug your life support. That's pretty much 
how the oligarchic organization of the economy is is in, in Ukraine and Russia, right? It's like they're basically holding these things that are the life support of the people living in these regions. And they're, 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 it's, they're not even like good capitalists. A lot of people think, oh, Russia became a capitalist economy. Well, well, technically, in an ideal world, a capitalist, you know, makes an investment and then gets a return on their investment. But in this case, you just have this kind of privatization of a very stagnant and decaying form of socialism where it's like, they're not in, it's not like they're making profits based on returns on, on risky investments. They're holding these gargantuan bits and pieces of the former Soviet infrastructure and charging people who relied on them as a source of livelihood and, and subsistence uh, in order to squeeze out not profits. And this is the most fascinating part of this entire dilemma. That's why you can't understand this conflict from like an anti-capitalist traditional critique of capitalism perspective, but from rents, right? From rents of the financial economy, right? So Haas, can you debate Michael Moore? Yeah, I could debate this guy if he gets in my fucking VC. Okay, I could definitely debate him. Okay, you stop spamming my chat. Michael, get in my fucking VC or get banned forever. It's simple as that, you stupid fuck. And by the way, Russia doesn't pretend to be a liberal democratic country. That's why you dumb fuck. If the West wants to come forward and admit we live in a fascist fucking state, then it can fucking do that and and, and cure the repercussions that comes from violating the fucking social contract that is the bedrock of order and stability. The reason people don't fucking take up torches and pitchforks like Thomas Jefferson talked about, is because we have constitutional liberties. If they want to create a new arrangement where they want to be an illiberal democracy, then they can go ahead and step forward and tell the people that that's what we're living under. Until then, you got to still have that free speech. Because that's the understanding that our people and the government have come to since 1776. That's my fucking answer to you, you stupid dumb fuck. Now stop fucking spamming my fucking chat. Especially when you say something so fucking stupid, okay? As I was saying before, okay, I want to give you a broad picture of the oligarch economy. So what did you learn from this? Okay, A, the Soviet Union collapsed. The Soviet economy was still the source of survival and livelihood for the majority of people living under it. What happened is that this Soviet economy was privatized by these parasitical financial capitalists who did not reinvest in the infrastructure, but merely kept it on a lifeline, leaving both it and the people relying on it to decay, left behind, while extracting rents, not profits from them. And these rents, in turn, were turned into financial derivative assets, speculative assets, derivative assets, basically, that were integrated into the world capitalist financial market through the city of London and its offshore companies, yada, 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 Wall Street, and the rest of it. So that's the basic rundown of the picture that's forming the context of this entire thing, okay? I want you to keep that in mind as we go forward. Keep what I just told you in mind, okay? And stop fucking being distracted in the chat. Do I have to start banning people? Because this shit is important. You know, I don't, I'm sick of this being a community of dumb fucks. Yeah, go ahead and just spam Z's in my chat, but you don't actually want to be fucking educated? You don't want to be educated about what's fucking going on in the first place. You just want to just spam Z's in the fucking chat. Bunch of dumb fucks. Stop fucking focusing on one dumbass who's too much of a pussy to get in my fucking VC. If you don't get in my V... Okay, mods. Ban everyone who doesn't get in my VC who talks shit. Because clearly people are getting too fucking distracted by bullshit when what I'm talking about is actually fucking important. Right? Damn want to just spam z's and shit but you don't want to actually think about this in any kind of fucking way it's fucking pathetic okay anyway like i was saying now the main thing that upset this arrangement was putin's rise to power now a lot of people underestimate the extent to which there was a level of continuity between the yeltsin regime which was completely captured by the oligarchs and putin there was continuity putin was appointed by yeltsin So the reason Putin came to represent Russian sovereignty is the the fact of the matter that we now have to address, okay? Because Putin, again, was appointed. He wasn't a populist. He was appointed, okay? 
He didn't rise to power as like a Caesarian populist like Hugo Chavez or anything. He was appointed by Yeltsin. Okay. Now, some deeper context here. The context of Putin is politics, specifically geopolitics. The first form of a major rift between the West and Russia was Yugoslavia. It was Serbia. And Yeltsin, actually, this was the first form of a, the expression of some kind of like, it wasn't just Yugoslavia. There's a lot of unresolved shit in Abkhazia, in South Ossetia, in Transnistria, and elsewhere, right? Russia was thrown into this situation where even Yeltsin and the oligarchs supporting him had to be Russian patriots in some kind of sense. Now, why was it in the interest of the parasitical oligarchic class to kind of adopt a Russian geopolitical vision? Well, the reason is pretty simple, because in order to be able to maintain the steady flow of financial rents that they were extracting from the privatization of the former Soviet economy, they had to consider Russia as a block with its own interests that it has to defend. I mean, it, they're basically trying to turn Russia into a cartel, one big cartel enterprise whose interests they were willing to def defend on that basis, okay? And this is basically going to like define the entire tragical contradiction that defines Russia's current geopolitical predicament, okay? When Putin was appointed, Putin made the decision to nationalize Russia's gas industry, basically cementing the first form of Russian economic sovereignty. And at that point, the very same, and also, by the way, the geopolitical issue was Chechnya, right? And that's what Putin dealt with and, and so on and so on. And that's that whole issue of geopolitics, defending Russia's territorial sovereignty, right? As a kind of cartel for these oligarchs. But Putin would then turn against these oligarchs um, for reasons that may relate to personal ideology, something like that. But Putin did cross the Rubicon, and his Julius Caesar moment was when he decided to nationalize the Russian oil industry, turn against the oligarchs, right, and start to derive his mandate from the Russian people. So in a way, and this may come to a shock to many of you, Russia became more democratic. Now, in talks with U.S. diplomats, Russian oligarchs ad verbatim said, Russia is not a Western country, Russia is an Asiatic country. So we cannot have an immediate transition to democracy. We have to have an oligarchy because Russians are too savage and uncivilized to be able to be democratic and, and rule based on a majoritarian, you know, uh, uh, rule by the people. The people are too stupid and uncivilized to rule. So us oligarchs have to be in charge. Almost ad verbatim, when they were sitting down with U.S. diplomats, this is what the oligarchs had told uh, the Americans. Well, Putin... Um, was increasing the democratization of Russia by having the actual source of legitimation and sovereignty of the Russian state not come from a select group of oligarchic rulers, but come from more or less a popular mandate of the Russian people. Now, Putin is not a savior of the Russian people. I want you guys to, to understand that he's not like some Julius Caesar communist and he's all doing it out of the goodness of his heart and it's because he's a socialist or he's doing it for ideological reason reasons putin was confronted with like a a, a rubicon and, and just to be a normal centrist right it's like nationalizing the oil industry will give the russian state a definite source of revenue with which it will be able to sustain the russian people on a lifeline because the oligarchs are not able to do this in a disparate dissipated way so under putin's reign and this is where we're going to really start talking about the tragical aspect of this um you still had the same level of decay necrosis and stagnation that defined the rule of the oligarchs the only difference is that there was increasingly a semblance of a new type of russia i mean moscow sure as hell got a hell of a renovation <laughs> under putin's reign uh, and other parts of Russia, admittedly, as well. Other stuff was going on, but for the majority of the Russian people, um, you know, they were living in the same way the people in, in Ukraine was. It's basically living in a lifeline. But lifeline being pensions, pensions for the elderly, um, the kind of menial jobs for the working class as they had before. And then Moscow also represented this kind of more urban economy with more urban-oriented jobs. Or, and then also you had this immense flight from Russia, the 
brain drain and people, migrants going to the West, young people looking for opportunities there. But also Moscow did turn start to be a bedrock for new entrepreneurs and, and new kind of startups and new kinds of businesses that was enabled by this newfound Russian economic sovereignty. All of these things undermined the oligarchs, right? So Russia's in this steady, steady state of basic survival. Survival. People, pensioners are still getting their money. The Russian people are surviving and enduring. That's not nothing because in the 90s, they were dying. They were dying of early mortality. They were dying. They weren't being supported by the state. There was nothing. Pension, yeah. They were dying, right? So they're surviving under Putin. But under Putin, you still have stagnation. You still have some of that same oligarchic control of the former Soviet economy. You still have that necrosis. You still have that parasitism. You still have this kind of sale of the Russian people to the Western financial capitalist world market in the form of derivative and speculative assets, right? This is true not only for Russia, but for the entire former Soviet world. Russia's stagnating. Now under Medvedev, uh, they wanted to even get closer to the West geopolitically to con- Facilitatory with them for geopolitical reasons, they couldn't. Now, let me tell you, uh, uh, let me give you a picture right now of um, Ukraine's exports, Russia and Russia's exports to Ukraine. Now, here you can clearly see these are all heavy industry. I mean, these are all heavy. In- so, these are kind of manufactured goods, and these are more, um, what do you call it? Primary processed raw materials. These are kind of more chemicals. This is, um, iron and steel and things like that these are kinds of like manufactured industrial goods so this is basically what ukraine is exporting to russia right but you have to understand that these are all controlled under the uh, these are so i want you to think of it like the intestines of the soviet economy ripped out right and privatized under the control of oligarchs and oligarchic families and There was a semblance of a centrally planned Soviet economy. And the bits and pieces of this economy were now being privatized by these like feudal lords, right? Who are extracting monopoly rents, feudal-like monopoly rents, in order to facilitate similar levels of economic um, activity that happened in the Soviet Union. So like the iron that Ukraine is exporting to Russia was probably also iron that that factories or whatever based in Russia were getting from Ukraine as well. So the semblance of this former Soviet economy is being kept on a lifeline, right? Um, now, what were what what really underlied the history that led to the Maidan and the dissatisfaction with Russia and the dissatisfaction with Putin? Well, stagnation continued to more or less define. The whole Russian sphere, Russia itself, and Ukraine under Yanukovych. Yes, survival. Survival, yes. But innovation, opportunity, no. Those are the things that we're missing. And kind of understandably, in the more developed parts of Western Ukraine, people were fed up with the old arrangement. They were fed up with the corrupt oligarchic class. So there there came to be this kind of like, illusion by the population and this is what makes it a fucking tragedy guys this is literally the crux of what we're talking about which is like there's many forms of utopias people have when they become dissatisfied with the status quo and with the prevailing system right and in ukraine western ukraine's case the utopia was europe there was this illusion this idea that increased economic integration with Europe is going to lead to, you know, the the um, the enrichment of the Ukrainian, you know, democratic pe- petty bourgeoisie and startups and entrepreneurs and this hungry youth that are looking for opportunities. Oh, we'll all get it from increased economic cooperation with with Europe and with Western Europe, right? And and Europe became this utopia. It became this utopic vision. Right. So when Yanukovych, um, so this is the tragedy, though. So Yanukovych, pressured by the Western Ukrainian population and also because he was not actually loyal to Russia in the first place, decided to pursue European economic integration. So he went to Brussels and he went to Belgium and he told 
The leaders, he told the head of the EU, he said, listen, he told the Eurobank, he told all these people, he said, listen, I am willing to join you. I'm willing to ditch Russia and join you. My oligarchs who back me also want this to happen, right? We're done with Russia. Russia's, you know, those people, they're deadbeat, they're, they're wasteful. We don't, we can't get any more profits from them. Our oligarchs are hungry for profit. They need more profits. So yeah, we'll, we'll join you, Europe, and we'll ditch Russia. But this is how economically dependent we're on with Russia now. So if we ditch Russia and join you, you have to give us loans and you have to give us aid and bail out our economy and help us. What did Brussels tell Yanukovych? Brussels told Yanukovych, no way, Jose. We're not going to invest in you Ukrainians, you lowly Ukrainians. We don't believe in you. You're not an investment that's worth it to us. If you join the European Union, yeah, we'll use you as an economic colony for cheap labor and migrant labor. Oh boy, yeah. And we're going to extract your raw materials and, you know, use you as a debt colony more or less. But seriously restructure your economy and fill the hole left behind by Russia? No way. Europe refused to agree to what Ukraine needed in order to join Europe and leave Russia behind. That's the story behind this. And when Yanukovych decided to abandon pursuing economic integration with Europe, not because he didn't want to, but because Europe refused to actually um, fulfill what Ukraine would have needed to do that, there you had Maidan. And we have to ask this question beyond America's intervention, right? Beyond America's intervention, um, beyond the CIA interference and all that shit. Let's just put that behind. Why were so many people in Kiev and, and Western Ukraine angry with the government that, oh, we're not joining Europe because you're in bed with Russia? Because this is the impression they had in their mind. They thought, okay, Europe represents for me economic opportunity. It represents a future for us. It represents us to be able to, you know, update our infrastructure, have just have a semblance of a future ahead where we don't have to be in stagnation and decay and, and corruption for so long, right? So that was the thought that they had in their head. And when they when Yanukovych turned his back on, on, on the European integration thing, they were like, he only did this because of Putin, and he only did this because of Russia, because of the corruption of the oligarchs. The same oligarchs that they associated with this stagnant post-Soviet world, right? So they thought basically that it's almost as if Putin is preventing us. The Russian world is prevent preventing us. Our blackened Soviet past is preventing us from having any more economic opportunities. And we're stuck in this hellish decay and stagnation of the former Soviet world. And we're going to blame it all on Russia. The truth is more tragic. It's not Yanukovych, it's not Putin, it's not even the oligarchs that are the reason Europe rejected you. Europe rejected you because Europe doesn't care about Ukraine. Europe doesn't care about Ukrainians. Europe doesn't see them as equal. Europe had no intention of investing in Ukraine and helping Ukrainians no longer become dependent on Russia because the Europeans have nothing historically to do with Ukraine. When Germany invaded Ukraine in World War II, they had a plan to starve anyone there and loot all the fucking resources and have German settlers settle the land. They are entirely different peoples. Europeans don't give a fuck about Ukraine. That's the tragic truth. That's why Yanukovych couldn't pursue European economic in integration. That's why. But the Maidan protesters, angry with the corruption and angry with the stagnation, angry with the lack of opportunity, decided that Europe was their utopia, okay? And it was a kind of like deranged form of utopian socialism that quickly transformed into a very scary Nazism and, and genocidal fascism where their dream came at the expense of reality and that Russians are getting in the way of our dream. So that's the scenario you have in the Western Ukraine, right? Now, going from heaven to earth, from dreamland back to reality, you have the people of Eastern Ukraine. Now, the people of Eastern Ukraine are getting by. They're getting by through economic aid, getting by through 
vestigial industries from the Soviet era. And yeah, there's not a lot of improvement or whatever, but they're primarily focused with just not starving and just having some lifeline, right? So they see what's going on in the Maidan and they quite correctly see it's like these people want to destroy everything. They want to destroy everything we have and they want to destroy us as a people because we ourselves only exist because of the Soviet past. Our infrastructure, our way of life, our culture, um, our ability to get an income, everything about us comes from the Soviet past. And you want to take all of that away and destroy us. So it's almost like this is the tragedy. In Western Ukraine, it became a kind of struggle for becoming and struggle for future and transformation. But in Eastern Ukraine, it was a struggle for being, a struggle for surviving, and a struggle to defend the past, right? So you basically had a very tragic situation where... Both people in Russia and in Ukraine are not necessarily aware of the fact that the reason you're stagnating, the reason you don't have these new opportunities, the reason you don't have this kind of like, you know, reinvestment in your own people, the reason nobody's willing to invest in you, the people, whether it's Europe or whether it's this, you know, necrophiliac kind of post-Soviet oligarchic economy. It's very simple. It's because Russia turned away from communism. And communism was the only fucking thing that invested in these people. It turned from an economy that was based in what's in the best interests of the common people to an economy that was based on liberal capitalist bullshit free market principles, which in reality translated into abandoning in almost a genocidal way the people and leaving them to rot at, at best or, or, or allowing them to subsist at best and leaving them to decay and die at worst. And that's the entire context that's informing this situation. People who were angry with the Yanukovych government were not necessarily at fault. It's just that they articulated it in the wrong way, in a delusory and illusory way. The real enemy of the Ukrainian people. Also never forget how almost immediately after healthcare was privatized in the Russian Federation, nearly 7 million rural Russians died from lack of healthcare. Now necrosis and decay rises in Ukraine, and oligarchs think they own the Russian people. Holy fuck, Voidbrin, thank you so much for the 50, man. And I agree, yeah, appreciate it so much. Appreciate it so much, man. I appreciate that so much. But um, the, the bottom line, guys, is that the enemy of the Ukrainian and Russian people alike, it's not a national issue when you think about it like this. It's a class issue with a civilizational context, the civilization created by the Soviet Union. It's these oligarchs who converted the post-Soviet economy into a feudalistic rentier state where they extract from the lifeblood of the former Soviet peoples while giving nothing back and investing nothing in them, especially investing nothing in the youth and investing nothing in the new generation, okay? So you may ask me a question, Haas, then why do you support Russia when Russia also has these people in power? Because you have to understand the context of the revolution that's going on in the Russian world, which is for all intents and purposes also a social and class revolution against the oligarchs. And that's something I'm going to explain to you if, if you don't understand what I'm talking about now. Because that's what's really going on. Since the revolutions, and they're very much Heideggerian revolutions for being in eastern Ukraine, you had a profound class and social revolution initiate which will undoubtedly spread to russia even if it comes at the expense of putin himself i'll show it to you now check this out this is a story published by the new york times on march 4th 2014 now why am i showing you an article from 2014 because in the eastern ukraine immediately after the maidan which duped the urbanites of Western Ukraine into actually serving the interests of oligarchic factions of the post-Soviet world that were against Russia, as tensions rose on the streets of the Russian-speaking eastern portion of Ukraine, 
The response of the new government in the capital on Sunday was not to send troops, but to send rich people. Keep in mind, this is March 2nd, 2014. The interim government, worried about Russian efforts to destabilize or seize regions in eastern Ukraine after effectively taking control of the Crimean Peninsula in the south, is recruiting the country's wealthy businessmen, known as oligarchs, to serve as governors of the eastern provinces. So, as these eastern provinces were up in arms and were in turmoil, trying to kind of rebel against the new junta, to give you an idea of the Maidan government, the response they had to that... Thank you so much, Sankar. Keep stream in a minute. Sorry, Twitch dogged you, but glad that you're still out here grinding and crushing it, Cuddy. Thank you so much, Sankar's Renault. I appreciate you so much, man. Well, as a basic response to that, right, what they did was send literal oligarchs to be the governors of these eastern provinces to rein in on these people. Now, when I said feudal lords, that was kind of like a metaphor, but in this case, it seems like it's direct. Now, wait until you hear about who these oligarchs are. So the strategy, which Ukrainian news media are attributing to Yulia V. Timoshenko, a former prime minister and party leader, is recognition that the oligarchs represent the country's industrial and business elite and exercise a great influence over thousands of workers in the East, which is still largely ethnically Russian. Now, what kind of influence do they exercise? These oligarchs own the industries in East Ukraine. They own the coal mines. They own the mines. They own the factories. And the Russian workers are their employees. The office of President Oleksir V. Turchinov announced on Sunday the appointments of two billionaires, Sergei Tartura. Let's look up this guy. Sergei Tartura. What does he do? Sergei Tartura is the founder of the Industrial Union of Donbass. What is the Industrial Union of Donbass? It's an, it owns order of over 40 industrial enterprises in eastern Ukraine, Hungary, and Poland. Um, there you go. I'm not sure what happened to its holdings in eastern Ukraine exactly, but this guy was a, this oligarch who I literally just described to you. The, the industries he owns... Heard about you through Jackson. I loved how you tore apart Destiny. Always good to hear independent voices that don't bow to the establishment. Thank you so much, Curtis. I appreciate it so much, man. That is appreciated, man. Um, when I, I mean, this guy, he says he owns industrial enterprises. These are all enterprises created by communist infrastructure. Communism created these inter- enterprises. This fucking parasite just gobbled them up and put them into a fucking holding company. So that's like the definition of what we're talking about when it comes to an oligarch. Now, who else are they mentioning? They're talking about Ihor Kolomoski. You've probably heard of that name before. Um, But if you haven't, this guy is the... He owns... Where is it? He owns the... uh, Yeah, Privet Bank. He owns... Yeah, he owns... That's just a fucking private football club. It doesn't matter. This is... they Sometimes these oligarchs buy football clubs. Like that guy, uh, Abramovich, owns Chelsea or whatever. So this was a Privet Bank... That owned, and this is where you're going to get the money, right? Well, in 2016, it was nationalized, supposedly. But he owns Privet Group. Yeah, Privet Group. There it is. It's not just a bank. It's a group. So it controls thousands of companies of virtually every industry in Ukraine. Steel, oil, gas, chemical, energy. The prime influence and expertise. You can bet what that means for Eastern Ukraine as well. This is the Privet Group. Understand? So these two guys were appointed the governors of Eastern Ukraine. So, and, and all over, you, this isn't just Eastern Ukraine. All over Ukraine, oligarchs were appointed directly into positions of power to lord over the people. Of If it wasn't enough that they fucking owned the common wealth of the former Soviet peoples, economically, they also owned it now politically, right? This is from March 19th, 2014. Oligarch governor seeks aid to keep Donbass Ukrainian. So in this article, you're basically going to see him say some shit like, Oh my God, the Kremlin-funded militants are calling Moscow to step in and take charge, and they're, they're taking over everything. And Western countries need to react very quickly and give us aid. We need urgent economic and humanitarian aid in the Donbass, or these militants are going to take over. So let me tell you what's going on. 
a big broad picture is about to be painted here. Um, this is also from the Carnegie Institute, and it's called Ukraine's Kingdom of Oligarchs. So a year after the collapse of Yanukovych's government, hope that the new Ukrainian can check the power of the oligarchs and install a new generation of reform-minded elites is shaky at best, right? So Ukraine's government officials and their backers in the West tend to focus on Russia's aggression. This is from 2015, by the way, right? So it brought down Yanukovych. It didn't diminish the role oligarchs play in Ukrainian politics or to legitimize fully the power of the central government, especially in the eyes of oligarchs, right? Maidan was a tragedy. Again, a tragedy. It's a tragedy. The people were duped to be an instrument of this oligarchic, inter-oligarchic squash, squabbles, right? Between Ukrainian oligarchs and Russian oligarchs. Um, they were united against Yanukovych, step by step, funded key resistance groups. And that's the thing, like, me and Jackson focused a ton on Western funding for the Maidan. But looking back, we should have actually focused a lot on the way these oligarchs were funding the Maidan as well, right? Because they, Yanukovych's um, grip on power directly threatened their, in, their um, interests, Maidan was a people power movement directed at, because Yanukovych was getting closer to Russia and then Russia, the oligarchs as a class are declining and losing power, right? Again, we have to understand this within the frame of class warfare. That's exactly what I intend. I wrote an article for CPI News that covered Kolominsky's ties. It's on the CPI website. Thank you so much, Chris Morlock. Appreciate you a ton, man. Thank you so much. It was none other than... Dimitro Fertash, who despite being under house arrest in Vienna, reportedly forged the deal that united the political parties led by Poroshenko and Vitaly Klitschko ahead of the May presidential election. Ukraine continues to be run by oligarchs today, yet the power dynamics between oligarchic groups has shifted dramatically. Most importantly, the overall influence of the traditional power brokers with control over Ukraine's metallurgical and coal assets is waning. Having lost $5.8 billion of his net worth in 2014, Rinet Akhmetov, Ukraine's richest man before the war, appears to be the biggest loser. However, he remains powerful and has the ability to broker relationships between Kiev and Donbass, where he still controls assets. He has ties with this guy, the self-proclaimed leader of the Donetsk People's Republic, and he's widely believed to be working with forces on both sides of the ceasefire line. His energy business, however, has come under pressure from fellow oligarch Ihor Kolomoisky, who until recently was believed to be the biggest winner of the post-Maidan era in terms of political influence. The war in the Donbass has led to a rise of patriotism across the country. The population in southeastern Ukraine continues to harbor pro-Russian sympathies. Of course, that does not mean many residents of the region actually want to be ruled by Moscow. This is a uh, whatever. Their attitudes are, this is in 2015. Kharkov, an eastern city, remains vulnerable to separatist-led violence. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this is this kind of broad picture of the Maidan actually increasing the power of the oligarchs to heights that have never been seen before, right? Is the basic broad picture we're, we're rolling with here, right? The question is, what is the significance, actually, of this revolution in Novorossiya, of the proclamation of the Donetsk People's Republics, Luhansk People's Republics, and now with Ukraine's special operation, the wider sentiment within Russia and the way the winds are turning within Russia um, because of the war? What you have going on is a situation in which these people who are a bad investment left behind and kept purely on a lifeline by these oligarchs and by this oligarchic economy and by both, to a certain extent, the Ukrainian and, and Russian governments respectively, are now taking up arms and establishing forms of political power, which remember, forms out of the barrel of a gun. And remember, it's political power in Chechnya, and in elsewhere that got put into power in the first place, that is coming at the expense of the power of the oligarchs, whose rule, mind you, is not simply as, as it is with capitalists, based on their ownership of certain types of property, but is based on their ownership and their capture of the state, right? So with guns, people in the Donbass 
are finally rising to the occasion of defending themselves as a people. Not only a people worth investing in as far as economic measures are concerned and as far as the economic policy is concerned, but as the ends of regional statehood, of both Russian statehood and, well, not Ukrainian statehood anymore, but of the state, new Russian state that's going to emerge, which emerges Novorossiya. So you have to understand the immense social revolution that is now at hand. These people did not have the revolutionary aspirations of the Western Ukrainians. The Western Ukrainians were sick of the situation. and They just started rioting and went to the streets and destroying things. People in Eastern Ukraine, no matter how fucked over they were, didn't have a revolution like that, uh, where they're going on rioting on the streets and, and whatever to cause change. They're defending the ability to maintain the status quo. Just like in the Iranian revolution. That's why I'm calling it a Heideggerian revolution. It's just that the status quo isn't what you think it is. The status quo is the essence. Let's just say the Dasein of Soviet civilization. Just like in the Chinese revolution with the Chinese peasants. You can have the Chinese civilization, but... Don't assume you know what that looks like. It doesn't necessarily entail agrarian backwardness and all the rest of that. This revolution that the people in eastern Ukraine are fighting is a Heideggerian revolution. It's not a revolution to go out on the street and implement change. It's a revolution to defend what they have. And what is under dispute is precisely what they have. And this is precisely what does undermine the power of the oligarchs. Because now... What is being brought to the forefront is the existence of the Russian peoples and the former Soviet peoples at large, if you will. But specifically, the Russian peoples of Russia as a civilization, right? Whether or not the ends and aims of this polarity and this mode of production will be about them, them, their way of life, their culture, their inheritance of the Soviet Union, their wealth, and their living being. The economic consequences of this, we haven't even seen as far as the system that's now in place. We can expect nationalizations to be possible. The oligarchs to have their power completely undermined. A true revolution for the reinvestment into the peoples of Russia. I mean, you want to talk about a democratic revolution. These were regions that were ruled by oligarchs. The Donetsk People's Republic and the Lugansk People's Republic chose leaders based on elections, based on what the people wanted. What we're witnessing is a kind of bourgeois democratic revolution. And that's an outdated archaic term, but it's an authentic democratic revolution. It's like a revolution like 1776 was a revolution where they're breaking up the grip on political power that the oligarchs have in order so that the state cannot be used as an arm of financial monopoly oligarchic capitalists. This is unprecedented fertile soil for an up-and-coming petty bourgeoisie to be able to have its chance in the sun. A new era for the Russian people. A new era for a Russian economy. A genuine and authentic democratic revolution. It's a democratic revolution. It's a progressive democratic revolution. (sighs) That's really the crux of what we're talking about here. A progressive democratic revolution. That's the story people have been missing here. Soviet democracy was destroyed by an oligarchic regime. From a materialist perspective, this democratic revolution... Its implications are open-ended. I mean, it's not even clear whether Putin is going to survive them. The Russian people have been awakened to such an extent. You can't put that back in the box. They are no longer accepting the necrosis and the decay of their Soviet past. They want to rise to the occasion of acknowledging their sphere, their polarity, as something worth not only fighting for with arms but worth establishing for as the ultimate ends of a political economy. The Russian sphere, the Russian world, this vlast, this civilization, is now something that's going to be worth investing in. It's going to be something worth investing in because people are investing now 
with something more, worth more than all the money in the fucking world. And that's their own blood. You don't think that's the epoch-defining thing that define, that even comes before capital? It does. Capitalism emerged from the context of war, from the English Civil War to the Thirty Days War. The ability for the sovereign to exercise their power through blood is the definitive context that laid the groundwork for modernity. Except in this case, we don't have the abstract sovereign leviathan of modernity. We have the vlyast and the polarity of the Russian world asserting itself and paying for that in blood, through war, through arms, through life itself. Are we looking at the revival of the Soviet Union? No. We're looking at something that even goes beyond the Soviet Union. We're looking at an awakening, which I still believe the Communist Party of the Russian Federation is best equipped to provide the necessary leadership for. The Maidan was a false revolution. It was a false overthrow of the oligarchs. This is the real revolution that's now happening. You know about all the talk of nationalizing assets and completely changing the economy. If you want to know how drastic the changes are, you just have to consult the changes in symbolism that are being discussed. I mean, look at this. The Communist Party of the Russian Federation is seriously proposing, through a bill it's submitting to the State Duma, to establish the flag of the USSR as the official flag of Russia. They are the ones spearheading this and leading the way. And why is that? Because they represent, from the very beginning, the independence movements of the Donbass. From the very beginning, supporting Crimea's joining and ascension to joining the Russian Federation. Communist Party of the Russian Federation, from the very beginning, spearheading and representing the former Soviet peoples and the Russian peoples left behind. That's where it draws its material bedrock of support from them. I don't know how else to cut it to you guys if you're not already convinced. Russia's returning to greatness. From a materialist perspective, Russia is returning to greatness. Russia is becoming a great power ag again. And it's not just because of its special operation in Ukraine. It's because there's a social revolution going on in Russia. There's a class struggle and social revolution going on in Russia that is dethroning the power of the oligarchic class. And what's next for this? This is an open question. It's an open book. The, the enslavement and the sale of Russia and its wealth to international financial capitalism is over. Russia is now going to draw its wealth through A, the strength and power of its own people, and B, this is what I didn't get a lot of time to talk about yet, further economic integration, China. 